I'm Mike Sheridan and this is The Dell. Hi, I'm Mike Sheridan and you're very welcome along to another episode of The Delve. So anybody who has been watching the show for a while or has been listening to the show on iRadio or as a podcast will know if they watched the last episode. At the top of that episode with Mark Manson, I said we probably wouldn't have another season until January, but that if an opportunity came up to speak to somebody I really wanted to speak to or I thought people who watch and listen to the show would find interesting, then I would take that opportunity. So that's exactly what this episode is, and I think we'll have one more in November. We might have one or two more in December, but we're not going to see, or you're not going to see, rather, week-to-week episodes of the show until maybe January. Um, And even then, it's a little bit tricky. You can't always guarantee, basically, that I'm going to have the guests, the spectrum of guests I like to have and I like to keep consistent with um, every single week. So, But that is the plan. Um, but you do have a couple of bonus episodes in November. So, hey, what are you going to do? My guest today is David Cross. David is one of the most recognisable people in comedy, I think. He's been doing stand-up since the mid-80s, the early 80s. He had a sketch show on HBO in the mid-90s with Bob Odenkirk called Mr. Show. Really huge show in terms of like cold following. People still really love that show. He uh, is also in Arrested Development, or he was in Arrested Development, even coming back for the reboot on Netflix we talk about that a little bit I don't think he was hugely happy with how things turned out we also talk about the fact that Jason Bateman was in Dublin and I did a web chat with him that's how long ago that was that's how old I am David has a movie coming out or that's out now uh, available like I rent movies on YouTube you can just throw in your credit card details and rent them and it's there on your account for a couple of days or you can do it on Apple TV or Amazon Prime Uh, you pay a rental fee and the movie's basically there for a couple of days so the movie's The Dark Divide, as is with cinemas nowadays. There's just a lot of them just aren't open. David's in Brooklyn and I think he's half on lockdown in Brooklyn. We're kind of half on lockdown or on level five here in Ireland as well. So movies are just released that way and it's it's just fascinating to see people still respond uh, to the art in the way that they have. Um, because this movie is, it's, it's a really lovely movie. And I watched it a few days, I, I say to David, I specifically watched it because I'd had the link from the movie to produce the centre on for a while and I wanted to wait until closer to the conversation with David and thank God it's good because when when stuff like that isn't good and you got to talk to the person then I'm a really bad lawyer but uh, thankfully the movie's really great it's uh, about a guy who treks across deep forest in the Pacific Northwest or around the Pacific Northwest in Oregon in the United States on the west coast of the United States and it's a really heavy story emotionally um, it's based on a true story too by a book guy, by a guy called Robert Pyle um, and it's just a really lovely movie and a really surprisingly lovely movie. David plays Robert so well. He never, you're never quite sure where he's going to go with the character. He doesn't play it straight down the line for comedy. He doesn't play it straight down the line for anything because this is a, the, Robert Pyle is a real person and wrote a book on his exploits I think in the 90s too. So it's a really lovely conversation. We'll have another episode in a couple of weeks too but until then Enjoy this lovely chat with David Cross. So how's everything? And you're in Brooklyn, right? You're in New York. So how's everything yeah. there? Um, you know, it, it's, it, was, it was good uh, for a while. but uh, uh, And I'm talking specifically the COVID stuff. But um, uh, it started, the numbers started creeping back up a couple weeks ago. So people are a little tense. And we don't want to get to the point because we here in New York, uh, at least for most parts of the city, people were, you know, well behaved and you didn't have that that childish nonsense that you did, you know, uh, uh, so much in the United States and also, uh, you know, plenty of places uh, around the world. But that kind of like, you know, we're wearing a mask is tyranny. You're going to take my freedoms away, all that kind of nonsense. So the numbers, you know, we everybody behaved and we got because it was really, really, really bad here. This was the epicenter for a while and, um, and nobody knew what was going on and we were shut down and we just sirens all the time. And it was, it was a very surreal, scary 
a uh, couple of weeks, probably three weeks of that. And then the protests converged with that. It was, it was nuts for a while, but then we got our numbers down and, you know, we started having out, outdoor dining and it's very, kind of very European here in the city. And, uh, um, and that's going to be permanent now. So that's great. And, you know, we're just, we're, everybody's wary of the numbers creeping back up and we're getting a little nervous. It's, it's how are you finding it personally? Like, are you, would you be an introvert or an extrovert? Being, would you be particularly social? Um, that's a good question. I, I guess I, I, I miss going out, but I realize I, I went out just kind of by myself. I don't have that many friends. <laughs> um, since I got, since uh, I got married and have a kid. Um, uh, which is fine. It's not anything. It's just sort of how my life shifted a bit. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a lot of it was uh, going out was based around kind of sports, going to bars and um, watching a baseball game or watching a football game. And, and so that was kind of taken away for a while. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of it and just having a, I've got a three and a half year old. So there's a lot of, you know, tending to her. So there's not a lot of going out and hanging out and stuff. And, um, uh, so it kind of, it kind of fit with my, uh, somewhat antisocial lifestyle. I just miss, I miss drinking by myself, I guess, uh, in, in a, in a, in a bar or something. And, um, I miss those days. Oh yeah. I hadn't seen, I hadn't seen a couple of my friends in particular for about four months. Yeah. They're all very strict here in Dublin as well. And then I went and so watched a football match with them in, in a bar and was very strictly socially distanced and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And it was great to see them. And then that following week, we'd arrange to, with all of our girlfriends to go and sit out and have some dinner. And I was like, two, two times in a week is too much. <laughs> I haven't seen them since. That was like in August. Yeah. It's, it's such a funny time in the world right now when I, I suppose funny is quite a broad term for it. Like 2020 has been like the shit show of all shit shows. Yeah. But I mean, at, at least it feels like it's coming towards some semblance of, of clarity, which for people that were recording this on November 5th, if we, mm -hmm. if we wanted to timestamp this, we would say Donald Trump just tweeted, stop the votes. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's, have, you been, have you been glued to CNN and MSNBC and everything? Um, this is probably the first, uh, not even probably, this is definitely the first election that I was not glued in. My wife is currently in Toronto uh, working on a show up there and, and, um, and she's very active and concerned as, as, as are most people. But, um, she was texting me and I'm like, I'm not, I'm not gonna, we're not going to know anything. And this information is absolutely useless and it's going to change every 15 minutes or so. So I'm not even going to look until 11 o'clock and I'm just going to enjoy a set and had a bottle of wine and some cheese and crackers. And I watched a couple documentaries and I didn't check my phone and I didn't, you know, log on as it were until 11 o'clock. And even then we had no, I still had to go to bed, not knowing anything. So I think that was a wise decision as, a, as opposed to getting upset and then optimistic and having, getting upset again and op optimistic again, back and forth and back and forth and watching a bunch of people, uh, anchors, uh, news anchors on TV who don't know what they're talking about because they don't know, they don't have the information is constantly fluid and, and changing. And, uh, um, yeah, I just enjoyed some movies and, you know, uh, and then at about 11 o'clock, I, I, you know, tuned in to see that they still didn't know what was going on and then didn't sleep very well, but, you know, first thing in the morning, check my phone and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm with my kid. We have a, a nanny, but you know, she's up at, because of daylight savings time, she's up at 6 a.m. So the nanny doesn't get here till 10. So I've got like four hours of giving her breakfast and going, okay, honey, you want French toast? Okay. Uh, uh, you know, scrolling, doing that. Um, but you know, there's, it looks like Biden will win. Uh, the Democrats, uh, proved once again for the, I don't know, 10th time election cycle in a row that, uh, including midterms that, they're just terrible uh, uh, at what they do. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, they're 
uh, choices are uh, inept, uh, their excuses are, are weak and, and I, you know, I, and I, this should have been a blowout. I mean, this, this guy, we all know who he is by now. Um, he's, uh, you know, we're in the, the worst pandemic we've been in uh, and, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people dead because of him. And, you know, the Democrats can't even flip the Senate. They can't even gain four seats. You know, they're losing seats in the House. It's, it's, it's uh, remarkable this, that it's, you know, uh, this country is just fucked. Just it's, fucked. It's interesting because I want to talk about the dark divide as well, obviously, which, which I really enjoyed. But I kind of got in, I was working on a documentary that was kind of encompassed the U.S. election to some degree. It was based on the left and the right. So this is last year before all this kicked off. What was it? What was it? It was just a documentary called Left Right. So it was basically looking at why there's a lack of discourse now and why people are screaming at each other. So mm -hmm. I kind of got very heavily invested in the primaries. And I would look at certain candidates and stuff in the primaries. And for and hopefully we're going to have them on the show in a few weeks. But kind of got, I looked at Beto O'Rourke and I was like, this guy's kind of amazing. And kind of what he's saying and, you know, how he speak. And he seems to be coming from a very real place. Now I get that, you know, a lot of people find a candidate like Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, whoever it is. And they're their guy, you know, they're their person that they just kind of get stuck into. But then you see how the media treats that candidate. And at certain points, it all becomes unfair, right? Because you're like, you build somebody up, you pull them down, or there's too many people on oh, the stage. The media is absolutely complicit in all of this. I mean, they, uh, there was, there was a, a bunch of, you know, kind of posturing about, will the media, this is from the media itself, will the media learn its lesson? Uh, uh, and you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't like a royal we, it was more of, uh, you know, as if each, each person who was riding was distancing themselves from the thing that they are a part of. And, you know, I'm numerous, uh, I, I mean, hundreds of these things, uh, across the board. Um, uh, and, you know, clearly they didn't and, uh, don't and won't as long as they're, uh, their main objective is either, you know, a kind of careerism and a paycheck and, um, you know, not rocking the boat, as it were. And, and a lot of these people just want to be invited to parties, I think. That's, that's their main goal is to be able to get to go to parties with some of the people they're covering. Um, oh, they're just, the media here is, is as complicit as any other group uh, would be. It's funny watching it evolve, too. You know, like, you know, what was about ratings with CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, whoever it is, then for a while it became clickbait, then it becomes something else. And as somebody who, you know, I edited a couple of big publications here uh, in my career as a journalist, I know how it works. You know, I know what you're doing and it's like doubling down. But anyway, I, I, we were watching the, watching the movie with my girlfriend, watched the dark about my girlfriend the other night. I made sure not to watch a trailer and kind of watching it from the start, my girlfriend was like, you would love this, you know, like just going off into the woods. <laughs> For yeah, like thirty days because I would be I would be an introvert as well. It's a beautiful film, David. It really is, and it's very well, sweet. Thanks. Um, and yeah. it's obviously, it's based on a true story as well. This guy sounds incredible. I know he wrote a book, and it's and it's based on his book. Yeah, he he's uh, um, you know I hung out with him quite a bit, and uh, um, he's just the sweetest, nicest guy. I I, pl I play him, and this is a conscious choice. They the the he's since the the true story that this is based on the the trek he took um in the dark divide which is is the um the biggest expanse in the united states of uh kind of uncharted uh wild territory um or at least the contiguous united states um and uh I play him a, a, a bit more uh, um, naive about the, the, the hiking. So he was, he, he this is a, a uh, amalgamation of a bunch of different uh, uh, stories he's gotten and he's written over the years. Um, uh, he hadn't written anything at the time. This movie takes place, which is 1995. Um, and then wrote this book and that be, then he became a successful author. And so we take a bunch of those stories and put them into one thing, um, artistic liberty. And, um, and 
so uh but it, but yeah i i play him with a bit more um uh naivete than he actually has and he's just the nicest guy and the, the sweetest nicest guy in the world um uh very very uh avuncular you know and he, and he has crazy big beard and he's very he's very santa like big big guy <laughs> too he's he's a big person <laughs> I know you guys went and you shot this in Oregon as well. I know the director, Tom Putnam, grew up around there yeah. too. I was looking at it and I was like, there's kind of, it's a gorgeous looking movie. It's beautifully shot. Yeah, you know, it's pretty stunning. And there's some drone shots in there that are just crazy beautiful. I mean, where we were was, was I've never been, I've been hiking. I've been in the woods. I've been, you know, most of my kind of uh, experience in that setting has been uh, on the East Coast, which are, you know, there's a lot of lovely stuff here, but it. Not, I've never experienced anything like the the deep woods in the Pacific Northwest. Everything there is greener and bigger, and you feel smaller physically as a person in those woods. The trees are taller and they're wider, and there's kind of vegetation you've never seen before, and it's really it's really something. And it it, it was uh, uh, yeah, visually very stunning. Did you guys? And I was wondering this looking at it because. I know you had a skeleton crew up there as well. There was no trailers or any of that Hollywood. No, stuff there's no the electricity. Woods. There's no, uh, there's no uh, internet. There's no GPS. You, and you would travel to the, a point, you know, on, like, on this like uh, uh, path that, this, that was just sort of rocky, dirty, dirt path. And until that stopped, then we'd have to hike further into the woods and, you know, lug the equipment. That's why it was skeleton crew. Cause you got all these, you got some heavy stuff there and, Again, there's no um, electricity or anything like that and setting up. And uh, so, yeah, no amenities. And if it's, if it's raining in the, in the shot, that's just because it started raining. And we had no, we didn't have the luxury like, all right, we'll break for lunch and then we'll come back in two hours. We just shot. So sometimes it's raining, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's crazy windy, sometimes it's not, you know. So it's difficult to location scout somewhere like that, right? Because it's, it's so interchangeable, everything's changing. Did you guys just reach a point, or maybe it happened more than once where you were like, this is stunning, we need to shoot this here? Or was that all predestined beforehand? Because there's so um, many shots in it where I'm like, you, you couldn't CGI that. It's just stunning. Yeah, there, there were, there were less, less of those than you might think, but there were a handful where we, uh, were, we were in, um, not too many, but there were some where we were uh, going from point A to point B and just like, hey, David, run over there, you know, put the jacket on, run over there, and we're just going to set up. This is just too, you know, there's like things on a ridge or um, uh, uh, find a, we found a bridge, you know, like just go, we're going to set up down here in the stream and you cross the bridge. And um, But for the most part, it was, uh, uh, you know, we knew where we were going or they they. So was there any like solidarity with the rest of the crew? Because you're running around in your underwear for so, for so much of it as well. It looked yeah. deeply uncomfortable, which is good yeah. for the role, I suppose. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was easily without question, without any hesitation, the hardest, most grueling, physically uncomfortable shoot I've ever done. But, um, you know, the crew was, we, nobody was getting paid. It was really DIY and it was, uh, and there were injuries or a number of, uh, you know, uh, doctor's visits and, and things that, you know, we had to take care of certain people. Uh, so we were all in it together. It was, um, you know, there, it was, it, especially the, the lava tube scenes and the, um, that was really difficult, uh, unpleasant. There's no air, you know, uh, it was very cold and wet. I, it was, yeah, and you know the ground is all lava, so it's sharp rock and stuff. And that was uh, particularly difficult. Some people had to go check check themselves into a hospital. Two people did after that, and uh, just to get checked for um, lung uh, stuff, lung stuff. That's <laughs> there's That's a lot right. of lung stuff going on at the moment. Lung stuff. <laughs> a lot of lung stuff on the brain. Um, uh, <laughs> there was like near hypothermia there was it was it was pretty brutal but we were all in it together you know there was it wasn't and they and they had my back they were very you know they were very good about you know not doing things that were completely unsafe and i and i jump at the chance and always had about doing my own stunts as much as i can and uh 
and I'm happy to do dangerous things. And a lot of those kind of scrapes and bruises uh, are real. You know, they're from really, you know, jumping down rocks and falling down things and doing my best. Um, uh, but they, they, there was solidarity for sure. I mean, we were all in it together and, you know, people were getting hurt together. <laughs> as, as dangerous as it sounds, it feels like the ultimate playground. You know, you can just, you're just out there with a crew. It must, it must have been creatively really fulfilling as well to just be, I mean, obviously you have a script and stuff like that that you have to stick to, but just for you to be able to play the role and have all this open space and, and, and this kind of room uh, to play Robert Pyle like this. Yeah, for sure. And, and, uh, and one of the reasons I did the film, uh, I mean, initially there's a story which I, uh, I, you know, I found very compelling and I'm not offered this kind of opportunity to play this kind of, of you know, dramatic and kind of fleshed out character who starts one way and evolves into this other person over this, this arduous journey goes on. Um, and both of those were, were, uh, you know, reasons I did, I, I chose to do it, but I would not have done it if it wasn't for the personality of Tom Putnam, the director, writer, um, who, I met with, we were supposed to meet for an hour at a bar in LA when I was out there and ended up hanging out for three hours, just drinking and talking. And he's completely amenable to uh, collaboration. And he let me rewrite whatever I wanted to rewrite. And, and I, that's the ultimate reason I did this. And so being able to, it's much more of a playground if I know that I can come up to him either at the beginning of the day, I've taken the script down, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Latin, the night prior going, what if I said this and what if I did this and knowing he's amenable to, to that stuff. And, um, uh, and then just being able to riff whatever I wanted to while we were shooting, you know, it was great. It really was. Um, and you know, there's, I'm alone a lot, but then there are those handful of scenes where, you know, like with Gary Farmer, who's the, um, the foreman at the logging camp, you know, those, that, what, what a fun, cool, interesting scene to shoot. And I like that it, um, wasn't condescending to, to either type of group, you know, the, the polarized groups of logging versus, you know, the non loggers, that's not <laughs> what they would call themselves, uh, earth firsters, whatever, uh, eco warrior type folks. Um, uh, it wasn't condescending to anybody. Um, and it was an interesting conversation to be a part of and, and to, you know, again, get to kind of work on the script. Uh, so the whole thing was playground, not just physically shooting it, but the actually making the movie itself, you know. You're somebody who's been developing their own stuff for a very long time as part of your career and some of the amazing things that you've done over the last 30 years plus or so, starting out as a writer, obviously the stand-up comedies in there as well. Has it evolved how how you develop your own stuff, how, you know, you come up with ideas for stuff, pitching it to TV, pitching it to Netflix, even the stand-up comedy aspect to it. In 2020 and, and 2020 onwards, do you feel like it's changed massively since maybe the early 90s before you pitched Miss, Mr. Show or wherever it was to HBO? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's a, a, it's a complete sea change of, 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 first of all, you have, when we were doing Mr. Show, that was, uh, sketch comedy, which there wasn't a whole lot of sketch comedy around back then. Um, and certainly not a lot of people pitching it, but there was a distinct difference between network TV and cable. And that was just starting to define itself. And HBO was looking, you know, to make their, uh, to make distinctive programming. And, uh, and we were incredibly cheap to make and, they just said, yeah, why not? I don't know if uh, prior to that, we wouldn't have gotten any chance to do that, I don't think. Um, and, and since we did Mr. Show, you know, now you have uh, hundreds more cable channels, plus you have streaming, Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and uh, all kinds of stuff. And, um, and so now there are you know, literally hundreds and hundreds more opportunities to have uh, a show on, but that show can be uh, swallowed and, and not really 
um, you know, there's a, there's a, the sense of nobody know, you know, you can't find it even on like Netflix, something that big, your show is on there and <clears throat> there's great stuff that I've discovered that I, I never would have known about, never would have made my way unless somebody, another human being that I knew said, Hey, you got to check out the show. Um, and in the old days, it wasn't really like that. You know, you had, there was less stuff. So, you know, uh, so that's a huge difference. And as far as like my own, I mean, I haven't really changed the way I pitch shows or develop ideas. I guess an idea will occur to me um, and I'll pitch it. And then somebody will say, yes, here's a million dollars. Or somebody will say, no, thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Uh, you're, you can have that water and we do validate parking. But uh, I mean, so that hasn't really changed, I guess. But I will tell you, I'll tell you the, the combination of uh, the depression I already deal with, uh, which I have a pretty good handle on, I, I think. Um, and that combined with the COVID pandemic and being locked down uh, uh, has really stunted my creativity as far as ideas. Um, uh, I just haven't thought of anything that I think is worthy of pitching and developing. Uh, it's, it's just, it's been a, a long time. And, and as, as far as stand up, this is a three part question. I'm answering all, this is, I'm, I'm rambling for Not at all. here, but it, I'm going to, so for, as far as stand up, that has definitely evolved because I've evolved as a person. My experiences have evolved. I'm a father now. Um, so that's a lot of, uh, you know, and the country is, is, evolved culturally and politically um or or maybe perhaps i should say devolved it's devolved um but it's changed so that's changed my stand-up as well so it's funny talking to different comedians and, and hearing different comedians talk about stand-up within a pandemic because we've had bill burr and uh we've had tommy tiernan famous irish comedian uh, on the mm -hmm. show as well but you could tell i could tell i could tell bill missed it tommy didn't miss it at all and I listened to your conversation with Mark Maron, which was just a really fun conversation to listen to. Mark doesn't miss it at all. And there's definitely correlations between, between him and Tommy Tiernan. It's like mm -hmm. they're not experiencing life outside and been inspired by different things. So they don't feel the need to have to go and do it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I can understand that. I've, I've experienced both things. I've experienced long stretches where I didn't do stand-up, where... I mean, if you think about it, the reason I didn't do it was I didn't feel that need to do it. And perhaps it's because uh, all of a sudden I didn't have the opportunity, even if I wanted to, and that was taken away from me, then I, I, I palpably missed it more because it's that human nature thing of like, I wasn't missing it until you took it away and said, I can't do it. Well, now I want to do it. But there's, there's a thing that stand-ups have that... Um, I don't know if other, how many other types of artists or creative types have this thing where it's really a, it's an innate thing. It's an urge. It's a, it's a, it's a part of who you are. Like I have to go out on stage and talk about these things in this way. And I missed, I missed it really deeply. And I, I even, uh, I put together two shows cause I'd done some of these zoom things and they're just not, it's, I, it's not for me. It's not my, uh, it didn't satisfy any of that stuff. And I put together two outdoor shows uh, here in Brooklyn, um, you know, very uh, pandemic friendly where everything was separated. People had masks on and there was a plastic, uh, like a kind of a partition thing in between tables. And it, it just, I did it twice and it just did not work. Uh, the, the distance of everybody and there, there, there was, uh, there was one bit that I was working on. Um, and just to backtrack for a second, I was working towards another hour and a half standup, um, had been for about, I don't know, six months or so. And had been doing these shows that I, I, the same way I put together the last two specials. Um, 
where I just do stuff, uh, talk for an hour in a basement in Brooklyn and uh, just develop material that way. And a really fun process, really enjoyable. Um, and I was about to kind of enter phase two where I've got, okay, I know these are the bits I'm going to work on. I'm not going to dick around anymore. Now I'm going to make these bits. These are the bits I'm going to work on. And uh, I just started that when the pandemic hit. And um, uh, and again, as I said, it's a really enjoyable thing to do. And the process is fun at every single stage. And so I, just, I wanted to the, the get out and work on this material um, that, I was, that I was having fun with and I was gaining confidence in and, uh, and bits were really starting to gel together nicely. And, um, and so I tried to put these outdoor shows together and they just weren't working. And there's one bit that is completely dependent on audience reaction, audience participation. And I was trying to do it and people, I couldn't hear people. They're like, you know, 50 yards away at a table in the corner. I'm like, what, what did she say? What? <laughs> Wait, carrots? No, no. Ma Wait, what are you saying? And it just, the, you know, huge it speed. off the flow of, the, of your, and your just, act and everything, was, yeah. And I, again, I gave it a couple shots and just didn't work and whatever. I, I, I look forward to the day when I can get back to the, you know, cramped, sweaty basements and uh, <laughs> develop the material there where it's hot and everybody's drinking. I don't want to keep you uh, much longer. I really appreciate the time. Um, we, I had spent about an hour, an hour and a half with the lovely Jason Bateman. God, about 10 years oh, yeah. ago now. It was when he did the change-up uh, mm -hmm. with Ryan Reynolds and he was in Dublin. So I spent some time with him. We did a web chat. So yeah. like that was a thing 10 years ago. Like TikTokers watching this are probably like, what's a web watch? Where people would ask questions for an episode, for a website I edited and ask, and ask Jason questions. And the volume of Arrested Development questions coming in then oh, yeah. was, and they were so specific and that some of them were going over my head and he was like, oh no, that's another Arrested Development thing. Has the, has the, how the like longevity of this show just, and the love of this show just like blown you away more so than anything else you've ever done? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, I get it. And, and also I, Ireland is particularly uh, um, a, a deep fan base for, uh, um, for Arrested too. But um, yeah, I mean, there's a reason why uh, we made what in hindsight was an unfortunate choice in, uh, in bringing it back for, for Netflix. Uh, but yeah, it was, um, it just lives on it and it's worthy of it. It's a, it's a really, you know, dense show that um, has immediate payoffs and then also things that pay off upon a second, third and fourth viewing. So uh it's a really you know it's a it's a fun show also to to rewatch uh i just watch i'm a big fan of community and you know loved all those when they were out and then pandemic just catching up on everything and and just watching that watching that first season just almost jealous like god this is just such a brilliant fun show what what fun it must have been to work on this thing you know and i think people have that same way i feel about you know, community that people feel about arrested. Is that yeah. one of the ones that you find people like recognizing you over all the stuff that you've done over the years and Steven Spielberg movies and everything else? And I miss. I mean, Are it's definitely, people? definitely up there. I'd say, yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. And you, you've you've played Vicar Street twice, right? You've played Dublin twice before. <laughs> yeah. And how did you find just 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 for the local crowd, David? How did you find uh, oh, the Irish shows and the Irish audiences? Oh, absolutely. You know, it's, uh, when I do European tours, there are a handful of places that I really, I just know it's same with putting together a tour that, you know, in, in the States or Canada, where there are certain places I can't wait to go there because it's going to be a fun show. And, and, um, uh, and Dublin is one of them, particularly that theater was, uh, is a especially nice theater. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you know, I know that Amsterdam's going to be great. I know that uh, Dublin's going to be great. Um, London, always a crapshoot, always a roll of the dice. Uh, Manchester's going to be great. Um, uh, Scandinavia, it's, they're a little more reserved. It's weird. <laughs> you do shows there and you get off the stage after like an hour and a half and you're like, 
wow, man, I didn't think that was so, was that great? And, or, you know, you're finished. And then you get this crazy standing ovation, like, what? You guys, <laughs> all right. I didn't think, I didn't know, I couldn't tell, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, Dublin is a place I always look forward to coming back to. Very enjoyable. Well, we look forward to seeing you here again soon, David. Thanks so much for the time. The movie's great, The Dark Devoid. Really lovely, beautifully shot, very well acted, uh, very well scripted movie. Congratulations. Well, thank you. That's very nice to hear. I'm, I'm glad you liked it. <laughs>